Audio is not on, but it's okay. Good afternoon or buon pomeriggio. I'm Paola De Luca, and I have to say today I'm a little nervous. It's my, even though I'm always on, I'm very often on stages, but I have a, a, an emotional factor with New York. With New, with New York, I can, you can see I'm nervous because that's where I started my career uh, 25 years ago. Uh, I still have a strong accent, and actually. My English somehow is fading away, also is becoming a little bit more polluted by other parts of the world, and I'm very honored and privileged for that. And, uh, but 25 years ago, I came not with a boat, but with a, with a plane, and I started my, uh, my career in the US as a designer. Uh, my first job being a designer for Fendi jewelry and watches, and then I, I took it, a, a very unusual journey uh, that made me be known mainly as a forecaster. Um, and I'm very honored to be working on international level because I am hungry for the world and different cultures. So I want to thank Lisa for giving me this opportunity of talking to uh, this interesting audience. I will make it a little informal because it's not my style. I hope I don't, I don't mean to lecture you today, rather we need to, to have a kind of a, a, a casual workshop. So you might even ask me questions at the end. I'll try to not to make it too long uh, because I don't want to bore you. I'm always wor worried about boring people because especially after lunch, you feel maybe taking a little nap or something. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, today we will do an overview on the millennial generation as well, but focusing on the jewelry sector in particular. And I'm not a marketer. Uh, this is very important to say because I had very um, uh, important uh, uh, colleague speakers before me, uh, uh, from uh, two academics to, of course, two marketers. Even though I do teach at the European Institute of Design and I lecture uh, sometime at Polytechnic of Milan, I don't feel I'm an academic by nature because I'm actually, I, even though I'm a nerd, I'm really always subversive. So it's a little bit kind of, does it work? Uh, now, before we start with, let's say, what we say is the good stuff, or at least the product, the pictures, the texture, the shapes, the colors, I really want to talk a little bit about what forecasting is. Because everybody says it, but they really don't get what it is, especially in the jewelry industry. Because the jewelry industry is a little bit uh, behind compared to the apparel industry, which, where uh, forecasting started over 30 years ago. Uh, so forecasting is really identifying market trends in the market. And it is not my objective in this particular case to talk only about uh, demographic data and number, even though that's what we also look at. Because once again, my uh, uh, division, and actually I'd like to address exactly what it is that I do and you know, what are my main roles in, in my activities. I am the creative director and the founder with Vicenza Fair of Tremvision, Jewelry Forecasting, which is an independent observatory that monitors jewelry trends worldwide, which is called something very specific. Additionally, of course, I have my own firm, which is PDLG Creative Intelligence, and we consult from fashion brands, or let's, let's call it lifestyle brands, to um, uh, diamond miners, to uh, trade shows uh, organizations. So our audience is very, uh, our clients and portfolio is very diverse, but we don't do everything. We actually are very specialized in what it is, research just for jewelry products, and I'll show you what it is, and its application, which is a methodology that we do apply into what we call design strategy, uh, and eventually also design development, okay? so. For us, uh, forecasting is not about predicting, and I never use the word predicting in my own uh, activities, because we do not pred predict. I don't have a crystal ball. We are, let's say, obs we observe and we are specialists. We collect data. Our data are not numbers. They are semiotic data, or let's call it image, visual codes, that basically we organize, we put together, and they become history cases of images. And, and these information are collected not from North America, not from Europe, but from all over the world, because for us, the world is very important. And that includes, of course, North America. So forecasting is very, it's like it's, it's, uh, information that needs to be applied 
to a business model, which usually the biggest, let's say, the big important corporation or big companies or certain companies, they don't, it's not a matter of size, do use in, in their, like, let's say, strategy. So basically, we, we look at, we monitor market trends, collecting data in various disciplines and sectors. And I'm going to go, like, relatively fast in this area because I don't think it's the core of my presentation. But I, I'm very serious when we talk about trends. And I don't like the idea that very often in my 25 years of career, and in particular when I started forecasting in 92 in New York, of course my example didn't come from the jewelry industry, rather from the apparel industry. And so I had to kind of self-teach myself or go out with my fashion friends. And then at the end I had the honor to work with Condé Nast International as well with Fashionists of Technology, where I was invited to teach classes and be a part-time faculty. But those are the three areas areas of, of scope or scenarios that we're looking at. One are the social influences, influences, the market indicators, and the goods human attitudes. And again, we are designers, we are not marketers, but it's very important that you understand how we approach collections. And, and, and also I have a, a note regarding my, my honorable uh, um, colleague speaker from this morning about design, and I would love very much to continue the conversation, and I'll pick up his glove any time when he wants to talk about design, iconicity, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, uh, social influences, uh, what we mean by social influences? Lifest lifestyle changes. And by lifestyle changes, we mean what is important in our life today? The biggest I event and happened since the, the year 2000 and completely changed radically our lifestyle, it's digital era. We went from non-digital to digital. That is huge. That is the biggest thing. We have changed our lifestyle so dramatically, we are still heavy, we are still trying to catch up. And I wasn't, I'm not part of the baby boomers, actually, I want to say it. I'm not even the millennial, I'm a generation X, and we are still completely not in the, in the, in the map of the marketers, because we are too small of a generation, I guess, and so we are not in there. But we exist, I'm here. Um, and then, no, because I'm not 50, but I'm not 30. You know, I'm in the middle, we exist, you know, I mean. And then there is market indicators. The market indicators are the, gold, the price, the, the, gold, uh, the, the price of, of metals, of course, and material, but also labor. So we look at market indicators. And like uh, my previous colleagues, they were saying, they, you know, they were like, the, 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 how relevant is the price of a metal? In this particular case, of course, is gold. Uh, laser technology has evolved dramatically oh, in the last decade, especially in the last five years. Also because of that, we are we're going to see in product direction how lace and abstract laces and cut out and 3D printing design is evolving and has evolved and is impacting design. And design or good design is a reflection of contemporary time. So that's what good design is. So if I have to say something about design as to show the a reflection of contemporary life, which is not just a stale reproduction of. Now, it is true that there is always a referral to our past, but it's also part of the map, and we are going to see it uh, immediately. And the result of all these social influences, which the digital era is just a consequence. We are not even talking about globalization, how it's impacting and has impacted the economy. When in 2008, Wall Street crashed, the whole world was impacted as well, not because it's America, because all the money from all over the world were uh, are invested also here and vice versa. Actually, the first stock market in the world, believe it or not, is Hong Kong. The second one is, the second one is London. The third only is New York. But New York, if it crashes, has a problem. The same in Hong Kong and the same in London. So we are the liquid society like Zygmunt, Zygmunt Bauman is saying, and it's you know, the biggest Polish uh, philosopher still alive, and we are linked to each other. So to me, any relevant conversation that we can have, even here in New York, it is about international. It's about the a world that is linked. It's an osmosis, whatever you want to call it. We cannot be American if we don't know what's going on in Ukraine or in Crimea or whatever. That's happening, and we have to be less provincial and more worldly 
Because sometimes things that they don't happen here, they're happening somewhere else, else, and sometimes somewhere else they are right now ahead of us. That's the truth. So it's important to understand everything that is happening. So now, what it is about global trends and local trends? Well, people is asking me often, what is a global trend and is a, a local trend? Global trend is something, of course, that is impacting on a global level. And ma many times the global brands, or even something that is, let's talk about before we were hearing about iPhone. Of course, Mac is, is a very strong cult and following, uh, but also Samsung right now, unfortunately for Mac, it's a big thing. You know, it's huge. I mean, if you go to everywhere in the world, Samsung is bigger. So this is, you have to really understand what's global and local, and sometimes local phenomenon become global. So then we, we get into the local feel. Um, this is, yeah, it's a little confusing, but that's what it is. I mean, there are things as phenomena that sometimes they start in a particular part of the world, or even a city, and, and, and then they become popular, and it's not by coincidence. Uh, trends happen because they're filling the gap of a need, not even of the market, of a need. We are Darwin evolution law every day. I mean, based on our social changes and our new need, we, we have new needs. Sorry for the, you know, uh, the, the, the repetition of words, but that's what it is. And, and when something is created and it becomes popular, it's an unconscious need that is being fulfilled. And believe it or not, society, humankind, we walk in a very similar way. If something happens in Australia, it happens here as well, simultaneously, without even knowing, it's in intuition, it's humankind. It's a miracle, but that's what it is. Then we're getting into trend cycle. How long is, this, is a trend? How does it last? And I always talk more from a value, abstract perspective, just, uh, versus just talking about our industry. But then I'm going to be very tangible, and I'm going to go from abstract into, uh, again, ma material to this, let's say, abstract concept. But long cycle trends are very much associated to new needs, to social changes. That's what, it, 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 so if, they, let's say, environmental issues, that's not a trend that is going to go away any minute. It is an issue. And the fact that we are into uh, organic foods and we are into nature more, and then all of a sudden, uh, digital photo photography prints is on, in our fabrics. All of a sudden, textures and, uh, are part of you know, our interior decoration or a lamp. It is an unconscious connection that we do, that we have, when there is an organic or nature-inspired uh, product. But this is it's monitored by forecasters. It's not a coincidence. It's really tapping to, into a need that becomes an emotional need as well, and therefore an unconscious attraction, a uh, pulsation towards something. The same is happening in jewelry. Uh, short cycle trends are ephemeral, but they might be relevant. What is a, 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 a short cycle trend? Short cycle trend might be something related to uh, I don't know, a, 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 a movie or a celebrity or something local. I'll give you an example. In Brazil, soap opera is very big. Uh, two years ago, I was going to Brazil very often, and Brazil, it was, everything was, it was um, uh, around the, an Indian atmosphere. So all the jewelers and, all, and, and, the, and the fashion designers, they were, everything was inspired to India because that's what they do in Brazil. They love soap opera. And it, so that is a, an ephemeral, uh, of course, let's say, inspiration. But if we see it, if we, if we view it from an anthropologic perspective, is also the need and interest for exotism, for something that is far, for something that we wish we can have and we don't have. So we are all fascinated by far horizon. Uh, and then we get into how do we monitor trends. First of all, our scope is the world. And of course, then we also, of course, we, for a living, that's what we do. We do research and we do product directions for, for companies. We are zooming in based on a nation, on a region, on a cities, on a street. The methodology is the same. 
one, and I'll give you some parameter. I'll show you how we do this. Uh, but because I think it's important to understand what's behind a product trends report. It's not me having a sense of fashion, walking around and saying, oh, I like this, I think it's cool. That's not what it's about. It's not, and I don't like to be associated with the ephemeral approach to uh, what is fashion, but fashion today, to me, it is not uh, a bag. It is a reflection of contemporary lifestyle. Jewelry are fashion. Uh, bags are fashion. A telephone today is fashion. Music is fashion. Music is inspiring. Music and subculture is extremely important for the jewelry industry. When hip hop was started in the US and it went all over the world, it created a style of wearing jewelry. And even though you, are, you feel it's not related to you, at the end of the day, you saw tons of chains, gold chains, and rings, and big, big and look, uh, gold pieces because of that. And you're still doing it without knowing. It's just being, in a way, passive to what's happening around us. So where are the epicenters? Epicenters are, of course, not everywhere, every, let's say, area is relevant, but every city, every urban area, every region where there are some kind of elements where codes are not forced. And what I say codes is, I had this, uh, I had this seminar, I, we had two days workshop in Mumbai a month ago. It was about future trends. And we were talking about this with a very large audience, and, and actually it was about how can we change the jewelry, Indian jewelry design, and make it more international. The biggest problem in that particular case that they have, but in, they are also the most fantastic manufacturer in the world, not only, but they are extremely extraordinary, the Indian manufacturers. Uh, it's because when you are in a surrounding, where you are judged in terms of codes, visual codes, and status, and social status, you, there is no room for experimentation. Why New York, or why Tokyo, or why Hong, uh, um, Paris or London are more creative than other places? Uh, because it, that there is such a mix of people, uh, of ethnicity, and religion, and social classes, that in a way it's difficult to be tracked and you cannot really, it's, you're not judged. So you play, you experiment. And in this platform, by experimenting, there is a quantum leap. And the quantum leap is creativity. And that's what's happened, what's missing now in the, uh, uh, let's say, medium retailer level. There is no experimentation. It's too safe. And when you're not, we are too, uh, uh, we are, we are, when you're too safe, you are not getting to the next level. Um, so, and then you're getting into, again, the parameters of consumer profile. We're looking at ge geographic segmentation. Now, the, the word that is very if, in much in fashion is geopolitical. Geopolitical environment. That's very important uh, because the geopolitical environment, it's really um, a, a key to understand your background. When we talk about people, and let's say a demographic, but I love the word psychographic, which is a different uh, reference compared to, to demographic, because demographic is an age. It's like, I was born in that day, that year. But it's, it's, it's limited at nowadays because, you know, you can be in your 50s and you can feel 35, and you can look fantastic, because the whole social fabric has changed due to the, to the fact that people are breaking, families are breaking up, people get married two, three times, they are, everybody are into looking good, they do plastic surgery, they have a trainer, they go to, I mean, that's what it is. Everybody looks great at 50, right? And you don't want to look cold. So that means that everything changed, so it's psychographic. As well, there are people that are 30, they, they look very old, and they, because they are told. So what it is the, a data, a date? The date is really, it's also associated to your social, culture, social cultural background, your education, where you grew up, uh, your parents, uh, not necessarily where, to where you went to school, but also the, your upbringing, that's very relevant. So uh, those are very important elements that we are looking at. But again, we are no marketer. This is just to, those are information that we need to collect to conceive a collection, to conceive a design strategy, 
And then eventually the, the company, could be a manufacturer, could be a designer, could be a brand, can also think about a larger vision, a macro vision versus a micro vision. Then of course, you know, media, and by media we mean of course magazines, uh, newspaper, political arts. Arts are extremely relevant not only for the millennial generation, because now this is just about forecasting, so we didn't even get to the millennial generation yet, but basically because the parameters are the same. We do not need jewelry, like my previous colleague said, because it's not something that we need. We need water, we need food, we need a home. Then, eventually, in the luxury world, today the jewelry industry has so much competition, which is from entertaining, traveling, uh, food, uh, technology, everything. I mean, disposable income are very little. So if you're not as sexy in terms of, uh, let's say, content, even with jewelry and gold jewelry, you're not interesting. Arts is a status that is very much associated to luxury. In fact, all, let's say, the most important global brands, they always want to as be associated to culture. Because culture, it's something that you can't buy. But it, you can kind of look smarter if you are associated to it, in a way. Uh, so that's why Cartier has his own foundation. That's why Miuccia Prada is, spa is sponsoring your artists. That's why all the most important brands that they are looking at the future, and especially the eye, the eye segment, uh, they do that a lot because that particular affluent consumer understand that the real status, it's culture. But not culture just reading, it's understanding the beauty of the arts. And the arts from ever have been inspiring design and lifestyle and the way we behave. Without culture, jewelry are nothing. Uh, and then, of course, pop, pop culture is very relevant as well. Because pop culture, and for us, of course, Hollywood or Bollywood or Venezia uh, or Cannes are very relevant. Because what's happening in Hollywood and what is it, not the red carpet, because to me, the red carpet is the equivalent of the catwalks. Trends do not start on a catwalk or, or on the celebrity carpet, rather in the content of the movies and why they've been picked. For instance, an example, American Hustle in the old 1970s, and it's not a coincidence that the custom designer won an Oscar, is very relevant for the following season. Last summer, in at the Victoria Albert Museum, there was a fantastic exhibition about David Bowie and his collaboration with the fashion world from the 70s. Right now, there is another very relevant exhibition, Silla de VNA, but then there is many, like there is a kind of a trail that is inspired by the 1970s, which doesn't mean the 70s are back, but there are some visual codes which are going to be back, and they are already in the, let's say, inspiring the, the photographers and the designers, and let's say the, let's call it fashionistas, but not in a demeaning way, rather in people that they have the antenna for what, what's coming next. And of course, once again, magazine, the net. Now, the net is a big topic, okay? The big topic, and I'm going to just go very quickly, because we think it's... I'd like today, at the end of this session, uh, to leave you with few key points. Because it's not about knowing, but it's really about understanding. And I'm not presumptuous that I feel that after, you know, I'm going to speak for 40 minutes, you're going to be enlightened by me. I don't think so. And, uh, but at the same time, I think these kind of platforms are interested, interesting. Um, not because it's, it's about understanding, like maybe out of 200 informations, we really leave with 10. The one that maybe they are meaningful to our life and our experience and maybe what we really care about. But I think that, you know, the, the web is relevant because of the information. And that's where the key to everything. Uh, understanding the, 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 the millennia or not, understanding the, mo the contemporary consumer it's very important by understanding the new codes. And the new codes, the problem that, I, that, I, that, that we always had in the jewelry industry, it's about categorizing, it's about segmenting, it's about ghettoizing information. We are a ghetto of gold, 
platinum, diamonds, fashion, non-precious. It doesn't work like that anymore. Honestly, I am very proud to say that I mix high and low all the time. I mix Prada and Lanvin. I mix, Prada, I, I mix uh, uh, a burger, a cartier ring with custom jewelry. And guess what? It's cool. It's very cool. It's cool to me. It's cool to many people on the street. I mean, who said that if you don't wear diamonds, you are not cool? Who said that? I mean, you can wear everything. And I'll tell you one thing, you know, the, 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 the global brands and the, I use the word fashion, but it's really lifestyle brands, entered the jewelry segment since the last 10 years and have completely changed the system. I mean, Michael Kors is kicking behind to many people by selling brass. Okay, and I'm not saying that that's what you have to do. We are proud to be in the fine jewelry world, but the fine jewelry world also include the Grisogono, Mr. Fawaz Gruuzi, and 20 years ago introduced black diamonds at Basel next to Chopard watches and leather. And still here we are wondering, ah, should I do leather in my store or should I do bakelite or should I do wood? It's like Hermes is doing it. I mean, how many people is doing it? Uh, it's like changing a mentality. And, and again, it's all about applying it to our business, but I see many companies struggling and unfortunately very few will survive. Uh, now we're getting into the millennial, let's say, part. And I'm gonna do like, Again, because we don't want to be, and we are not marketers, so I'm going to skip, let's say, the, the, the part that was already mentioned by um, you know, my, 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 the, my colleague speakers. But I think that I'd like to say that, of course, the millennials are very selective. And, but this is very interesting. The shopping has to be a form of entertainment. This is very important. It's about entertainment. It's not about another thing, and again, I come, my background is, even though I lived here almost 20 years in this country, I also am exposed to, you know, the, the world, and now I've relocated back to Europe. And, 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 and the reason why I'm saying that is because I see things from many perspectives. Not necessarily is good or bad, but I, I move around a lot. And, and that is giving me, like, a perspective, and one of the things that I see is, like, being deep and just looking from this perspective. Um, the web has changed the perception of jewelry, not only among the millennia, but also about uh, the, the older crowd. Um, and, and people, not only like you know, other people said before, they are shopping online or pre-shopping. Um, they want to be entertained, and, and why should they go to, the, to a retail shop when online sometimes is more fun? Because it's not a matter of there is just the story, but there is more information, it is romanced, but it's also, it makes sense. It's like, ah, I can, you know, they tell you about how things are done, uh, the style, they talk about social, social gathering. They, so, they, they are cool, you know, it's cool or elegant or chic or whatever you want to call it. Each, where, each uh, um, let's say, area is interesting for something. Um, we, they said that already, did my other speakers, so I don't want to talk about that. But the word authenticity is very important. I think that the concept of design, and I, and I agree with, 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 the, with uh, uh, my, my, my colleague speaker, the second one, I don't remember his name, when he was talking about there is a lot of speculation on what's design. Design, it's tangible, but there is a lot of speculation about design and design and, ju and design uh, um, jewelry. Uh, I think that people come up with brands in a week. Oh, let's come up with a concept, let's do that, let's have a name and let's do the thing. That's a brand. It doesn't work like that. It's fake because people understand that it's fake. You just made it up. Uh, authenticity is something that you can trace an origin of a product, or authenticity is something that is really truly created and conceived and sold that way. It's not a made-up story. You can make up story, but the the people that really they really made it, they usually are people that they believe in it, and they are consistent, and they are not like ups and down with their, their idea, and they, it not necessarily they have to be idealistic, but they know exactly what they want and they believe in it. 
Now, of course, celebrity culture is relevant, but you know, it's relevant just as you know, relative like models or aspirational models to follow. Could be an intellectual model, or could be just simply, simply like a superficial uh, appearance uh, or aesthetic. But they can be to a certain age, but also to older people. There are people that are going to, to the doctor, say, can I have this nose? Can I have this uh, whatever? And it's like, it's, it's about, the, it's, it's part of this, you know, part of this culture not all of it, but some of it. Subculture, I think they are very important for millennium. What do we mean by subculture? Uh, subculture are important in, uh, um, in, uh, in, for the millennia and for every people, every, everyone that is sensitive to culture in, in general. By subculture, we mean uh, what's happening in the music industry. For instance, watching videos, it's important for you. It should inspire you because it seems superficial for, for some, because maybe you don't care, you don't think it's relevant. But it's relevant because at the end of the day, people look at that and they want to be dressed like that, or they feel like that, or they want to wear that. Like, and I make example. When the skulls, like five years ago, were big, I mean, no, actually, at the beginning, no one is, it was like, no, it's underground, it's punk. For some people, it was just like, kind of a motorcycle look. Then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to, to have skull. From Vicenza to Vegas to Hong Kong, everybody was doing skull. And the skull was really coming from the underground crowd. I mean, that's really, like, in the, na, punk. Punk is big. I mean, you saw Fendi last season. There are all the studs. Valentino did the studs uh, shoes like two years ago. Studs are in. And he was like, why studs? Well, if you trace down the phenomenon and why things are happening, and maybe you get some forecasting, or like some inf literature that can explain to you why it happens, maybe you know things bef before the, the, they actually happen. That doesn't mean you have to do studs. No, knowing certain information doesn't mean that you have to do that. But the fact that there are gold, in, I, I often get, the question, so what's going to be yellow gold? Is it going to be white? Is it going to be, they ask me. And I go, honestly, nowadays, in the world, and then we can talk about North America, we can talk about just Boston, we can talk about just a certain Park Avenue crowd, we can talk about Harlem, we can talk about Brooklyn. I can also, based on your uh, psychographic, which color? Today, the color metal, it's, what, it's, it's a color. Like, Gold is coming in oxidated, it comes in brown, it comes in pink, it comes in yellow, comes in white, comes in blue. Do you know that? I mean, there is an evolution in galvanics, and I'm not talking about underground, I'm talking about mainstream, I mean, mainstream Basel, if you go to Vicenza, to the Italian manufacturers, there are Thai manufacturers, they're doing blue 18 karat gold and diamonds uh, pieces. And, and so this is very important that you understand that. So it's not about a color, it's about what goes in a certain crowd. Now, if we talk about bridal, or let's call it in the classic, uh, or let's say um, segments, it's kind of similar, but within that there are evolution as well. Because there is black gold and oxidated gold also in certain bridal pieces. Because nowadays, there is an underground, or at least a niche market, they want something different. In fact, they don't just want only white the diamonds, they also, they also want yellow, pink, but also other diamonds. Some people, they, in Europe, for instance, we don't use diamonds. We use, like, from sapphire to emeralds to anything. We don't care about if it's a diamond or not. It's an engagement ring. Uh, of course, the computer, and I'm going to stop very quick with this, Blogs are very important. I mean, if you want to know something, and you know that more than everybody, because I have to say that America has really evolved this, the communication between, you know, let's say the corporation, the system, and the final consumer, there is a lot to learn from blogs about directions in jewelry. The interesting thing is that for some reason, and I'm not generalizing, but, you know, most of the it, it, the, the retailers, they're really not listening and not, not observing. So Prado looks very similar because they say, well, it sounds good what you're saying, but then 
my core customer just by a study ring. Well, have you tried to show something else? Or can we talk about it? So blogs, which are not only, I think what's interesting about blogs and, and the web in general, is not, it, it's really crossing and bridging the, the, again, a lifestyle concept to jewelry, which is, once again, is not isolated to it. Very quick, because I'm not promoting any blogs here. I'm just trying to make a point. I'm not paid by anybody to do anything except, you know, I'm paid already. I mean, I'm here like free of charge. Uh, I know, it's true. I mean, I'm not selling a metal or diamonds or something. I'm an independent. Uh, I bring like independent information. Then it's up to you to basically take it or leave it or whatever. But anyway, internet versus retail. This is the biggest battle. Uh, one thing, I, I'll tell you the good news to the retailer, as I always say uh, to who, publishers, because at the end, you know, I publish myself editorial product, and this is one of it, but not only. Um, for some reason, I, I believe in the printing will never go away, in spite of what people are saying, because actually I believe that books are going to be printed more and more, and maybe they're going to be even like Latsuri books are growing, because of course, what is a screen, it doesn't have the tactile effect of a wonderful book. The smell of the paper, the ink, and all, even the fact that you're writing notes on it, the fact that you can just put it on, on the side of your bed, or you can just write. It's good to have a book. And, and it's good to go to in a store and feel special because you're celebrating yourself or somebody else, but the store has to be an experience. Now, when we go to... I mean, look at the, 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 the cases of Abercrombie and Fitch, all these, like, you know, kid, kids' stores that there are lines outside, and you go inside, there's really like a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. But the, tr the thing is, is the whole experience, there is the smell, and the cute boys, and the cute girls, and the old lighting that is down, and the, the ocean, you're really walking in a virtual experience. It's an IMAX experience. I mean, then when you go to buy a, store, buy a, jewel, a jewel that is you're spending from a minimum of like 300 up to 5,000, 10,000, whatever, you go there and there is someone that it takes out a couple of pieces and there is no experience. And the experience is important. Now, some of the very high-end retailers are doing it, but it's few. And I think this is what it's really important to understand that, because this is to me is design as well. Design is a style. Design is not, the, the concept of design has changed. Like uh, he was referring this morning, I don't remember his name, but he was referring, it was to, uh, the cooning, it was like just spraying, you know, painting you know, around, it was just like throwing. It was a casual uh, study, it was not, it was, it wanted to be like that. So it was really experiential. It was not just a painting on its own. But when you go in a store, you want to leave the experience. And the same is happening at trade shows. Because now I came to, because I was looking at Cindy Edelstein. <laughs> and I was thinking, the same, shows do sell experiences. Everything is about experiencing. I mean, when you go to a show, to a trade show, the reason why you go or not go is because it's giving you an experience. So if you go to Basel, you feel like, oh my God, you see the grand of these incredible shows with billions of dollars of booth equipped by the watch uh, brands, and it's incredible. I mean, you, you feel like you are in luxury just because you are walking in it, even though you're broke. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Anyway, now let's focus on jewelry finally, and let's, let's see how is, this whole thing you know, really applies. I think that, again, I like to just stress this thing, personalized and custom product, authenticity and craftsmanship, uniqueness, and I love the word imperfection. The concept of imperfection it's be, is, is very relevant now in design, and by imperfection I mean something that it doesn't look all the same, and I want to make a grand ex example. I remember that in the 90s, and now I see my friend Jeff, Jeff Tarashi there, when he was head of QVC, I had the honor to, to do something for them at that time. 
QVC and all the home shopping network people, the, the TV people, wanted every piece of jewelry to look the same, with the same stone, with the same color, everything. And it's impossible. How can you have a blue topaz, always the same shade, always the same? It doesn't come that way. And when they were ordering 1,000 pieces, it, they didn't exist. So they came back with, you know, like uh, art artificial, they were like synthetic, uh, uh, they, wanted, they wanted real, but then they knew it was synthetic. Because it doesn't exist. And the beauty now is that design has shifted into, it's beautiful to have a stone that has inclusion, it's great to have diversity in the pavé, in fact, there is a name that we call organic pavé, it's a pavé that doesn't look the same. Patterns, regular patterns are boring. We like uneven patterns, asymmetric, because it's modern, because it's cool. And that's what they like. Even in the nail, you know, the, the, the nail, the manicure, the kids and the girls, and sometimes I try to be a kid myself, they do like a little different nail or two. And even the studs, they're one different than the other one. Even the sneakers. I saw the guys at the gym. I mean, go to Equinox and they wear different sneakers. So they, pair, they buy two pairs to mix it up. <laughs> I mean, it's cool. I mean, think about it, right? So what I'm saying is, we have to get that in the jewelry industry. Okay, next. And then, uh, return to the original tradition, but I want to skip this, and I want to get to, uh, of course, you know, now I'm just showing some of the jewelry shopping online, and what I think is cool, look, even like just the rula la, uh, you know, page, it's cool, it's entertaining, it's a newspaper, it's a style, and then it's really they're selling you the bracelet. I mean, it's happening. It's, 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 it's entertaining. You might go from the, from the celebrity, if you're interested, to the, the Duchess of Style. You can go to Diamond. Even the language is here. Ready to rock. I mean, how many times you go in a store and you get that vibe? Very little, right? And now, this, let, let's say the youngest, uh, but not only, they need that. They want that kind of flavor. So now we're getting into the consumer profiles, and we're doing season 2014-15. Um, now, Lisa, I want to ask you a sec, how much do we have? Because I don't want to be off the program. And I know, yeah. OK. So basically, um, we, as, as, a, as an independent observatory, we work like in the apparel industry two years ahead of time. Uh, in fact, my clients in Milan and in Paris, they already had their forecast delivered in May, in, no, actually last month for fall, winter 15, 16. Uh, in September, we are basically out with uh, season 2016. We're not magic, because if you go to Premier Vision in Paris, they have already shown fall, winter 15, 16, and they're doing textile, and they also they're doing accessories there. So all the visual codes and all the atmosphere in, in terms of inspirations are already published. The only thing that we do is translating these um, codes into uh, 30? Otto. Otto. Ah, so I have to be very quick. Grazie. Uh, so basically, we have here we are introducing uh, four consumer profiles, uh, the sensualist, the romantic, the exoticist, and the digitalist. Regardless of the name, um, you know, it's important that we understand the point. So, basically, um, the sensualist abstract minimalism. Now, the minimalist, I don't have to tell you much about the minimalist. First of all, I like to say that the market is not divided only in four consumer, but we are more multifaceted than just like that, than just that. In fact, when we are publishing our report, there are what we call sub-trends. You can be a minimalist, and some people can be a little bit more, let's say, uh, uh, organic feel, some people that can be a little bit more modernist side, but at the end of the day, let's say the visual code and are similar. Now, material might shift, may change, and, but at the end, the essence in terms of visual codes are similar. 
uh, so I'm going to skip the, 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 this, and I'm going to get into product. So we usually, um, in this particular case, we are focusing on, uh, we, we call it millennia, but it's really like, if millennia is people from AD or like, because generation, if you go on the internet, uh, millennial are considered from the 1980s to the year 2000. But also, the Generation X, uh, which I am part of, is late 60s, early 80s. So there is a little bit of overlapping. To make a long story short, there is kind of a big chunk of people that they go from 20 to 25 to 45 and almost 50 that they like similar things nowadays. Of course, based also on their lifestyle. So fluid lines are very cool, and they are already happening in the market on a really broad spectrum worldwide. So the, the selection of product that you see, uh, it's made out of uh, um, in, um, international brands, but mostly American brands happening. We are not just using gold pieces, but we are, it's a combination of precious pieces and non-precious as well, from big brands to independent designers as well. What we call interlocking, there is a lot of this design, and by interlocking we mean not only fluid lines and structures, but also material. This piece here, Mr. Degree Zogono, it's, I don't know if, actually, is Mr. Uh, Fawaz, Gruog, Fawaz Gruosi. This guy uh, has been putting together leather and diamonds and gemstones since the last 20 years. Uh, the man is in his late 50s, he's not even like a young guy, but he's, it's like he has a store also in Madison, on Madison Avenue, and his pieces are from 3,500 and higher. Links, links uh, in this particular, let's say, world, very strong, very popular, in particular macro links, we say, or micro links associated together. Um, chunky links this season, again, even metal, so you're going to see chunky links not only in gold, precious gold, but unfortunately also in brass plated and other things. Also combination like cararos of non-precious and precious. This is the biggest revolutionary uh, revolution that it happened. Even though Verdura for Chanel in the 1930s already created bakelite, yellow gold, and diamonds, and gemstones, so it's not new. Because in the 20s and the 30s, Cartier and Verdura, among others, they were doing this already. Actually, in Art Nouveau, René Lalique introduced horn and non-precious material with precious material. So we are not discovering any will here. The only thing is, now is becoming versus niche mass market. Either we like it or we don't. Ebony is being used already by very important high-end brands, inclusive, inclusive, including Vernier, is a very important company based in Milano, which is very important internationally. They have a headquarter in London for a long time. I'm going to go very quick here because you know, I know we are, we are time constrained. Also, soft effect, I mean, soft chains with a scarf effect in with micro link or thin chains. But the bold and beautiful, like big, bold and beautiful, like David Webb was saying in the 60s, a, 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 a company that is a big New York brand, which is back very strongly in the market, reinterpreted, and it's, it's very, very important. Heritage is very important as well in these seasons white and, and all like inlay design with this white design and mother of pearl. So as you can see, everything is very emotional, as a very distinct element of design. When someone says there is no design, everything is being made in a way. But from the Roman Empire until now, even granulation has evolved and is no longer the same. Technology is very different and if you see from one slide to the other slide, there is such a diversity of creativity that is incredible. And I think this is one of the most fabulous time in history in jewelry design because usually the business went from the father to the son in the jewelry industry. Now it's changing and there is a new uh, breed of designer which are not completely related to this industry that brought new fantastic codes. But let me go back to this uh, sorry, 
no, I can't. I wanted to show you the black uh, 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 metal which is associated to yellow gold. Now we were talking about cutout and 3D. Lace and all this cutout because of the laser uh, uh, technology taken to the next level. And now there are even like layering. Uh, if you see in the Isharia uh, bracelet on top, there is mother of pearl and gold, but there is a lot of layering, and the layering is becoming more interesting not to copy. As you can see, in the, on the right side, there is actually colored metal, and it's precious metal. This is very important. There are new techniques. In order to beat the competition, the manufacturers from all over the world, they are becoming uh, more interesting. They are evolving technology to the next level. This is a very important historical time. Second consumer is, let's call it the romantic vintage flavor. Of course, the celebration of the previous century, uh, meaning the 1900, but also a uh, memoir, or let's say archive of memories. So codes taken from the past, reinterpreted, because especially the youngest, they are hungry, they are interested to their origins and heritage and roots. Um, so very important is from the royal feel, we call it, to once again, curl and swirls filigree. Now you're seeing this application of lightweight from Tiffany, as you can see, to Ken and Jay Lane. So we are going from custom jewelry to, to uh, white gold and diamonds, codes are very similar. And it's, this is very important. I mean, how, now again, here, it's, this is like all precious gold and stones, lightweight laser capping. This is very interesting at the bottom. It's mixed with textile. The biggest thing now here also in the fine jewelry industry, very close to textile. I'm gonna go quick because we have limited time. Flora continue to be uh, important, relevant, but there are new hip elements. Look at this ring at the bottom. It's really kind of coming from the street in a way, but this is actually, this company, it sounds Italian, but it's not, I know the guy, uh, is uh, Turkish, Mr. Mustafa Kamar. He owns this brand called Roberto Bravo, and I think it's very interesting because he, he kind of took a street style and made it cute and interesting. So as you can see how things are really happening already to the next level. Pearls for these following seasons, but a little edgy. They are not necessarily too classic. They are interesting. They are kind of cutting edge. Um, black, black and white in particular with black stones or black diamond or oxidated metal in contrast with white. Uh, third, very interesting, uh, let's say, uh, outline of, of this consumer profile, avant-garde exoticism. I think that what really the digital era abroad is globalization, but globalization is the beauty of being everywhere in seconds, and really learning and getting inspired by people from all over the world, including uh, design and trends and way we are putting together things. I was recently in, in Hong Kong, and I love how people place with things and I never thought about wearing it together. And it just worked and I never thought about it. I thought, hmm, I, sometimes I see things that I go like, do I like this? And then after you go, yes, I do. And I never thought about it because sometimes we are too close in our own ways. Uh, these seasons, and already started actually, and, and, and by season I mean like already started like, for like two seasons or like last year, uh, what we call ancient gold feel. Brush metal, a little bit darker. I'm not now talking about 14K, 18K, or 24 carat, but this brushed, uh, ha hammered, uh, kind of archaic feel, very cool, uh, kind of just excavated from archaeologic site. As you can see, what I'm saying, Atelier Zobel or Yossi Arari, the, the, the pavé, it's no longer just regular, but it's irregular. Everything seems like casually done. It, it's instead, it's, it's more difficult, there's a lot of hand labor, but it's also simulated sometime, also from mark, mass market manufacturing. Hammer finish, very strong. Uh, as you can, on top, the fifth season by Roberto Coin is actually different color metals, yellow, pink, white, and black. Okay. So I'm gonna finish because my time is off. And uh, 
I thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't bore you. Uh, <laughs> Let me do this. You can go on this website, Trend Vision Jewelry and Forecasting, www.trendvisionjewelryforecasting.com, or The Futurist Paola De Luca. Pleasure. Thank you. Grazie.